Okay, guys, 25 high yield facts for you. Simply step one, microbiology, 25. So for granules, uh, think Actinomyces israelii. So Actinomyces is an anaerobic branching filamentous gram positive rod. It's important that you know that it's anaerobic because we're comparing this bacteria to Nocardia specifically, which is aerobic. So Actinomyces is anaerobic, Nocardia is aerobic. Um, Actinomyces causes a cervical facial actinomycosis, which is essentially uh, you're going to have a patient with a big mass on their face or neck. It's going to be a non-tender, draining, thick, yellow pus. The reason I put an emphasis here on non-tender is because you're going to have a lot of other uh, conditions that are going to cause uh, tender masses. For example, epiglottitis is one, um, you know, something in your differential. You have Ludwig's angina. Um, so just remember that um, this particular condi condition, the cervical facial actinomycosis, is non-tender. Uh, treatment is with penicillin and uh, you know you could uh, incise and drain the lesion potentially but uh, you want to remember that your drug of choice here is penicillin. Now again we're comparing this to nocardia which is an aerobic branching filamentous gram positive rod so it has a lot of the similar features in terms of um, its histologic features to um, actinomyces but it's aerobic. It's also weakly acid fast so that's where it's going to kind of distinguish itself again from actinomyces. Actinomyces is not acid fast at all whereas nocardia is weakly acid fast. And there's a um, a SNAP mnemonic here, so sulfa drugs, your TMPSMX, that kind of thing, is going to be used for nocardia. And again, the penicillin is for the actinomyces. 24. The exoides tick is the vector for Borrelia, Anaplasma, and Babesia. So, um, you know, when, when you see exoides scapularis, you're thinking immediately it's Lyme disease, right? That's not always the case. So, Lyme disease um, is easily distinguished from these other two bugs, right? So, Lyme disease, you have your erythema migrans. This is the rash that you see here. And um, my saying is, when in doubt, you treat with doxy. So that's something I kind of always told myself, and it usually is right. If you're not sure, you usually treat with doxy. Uh, and Lyme disease is one of those where you're going to treat with doxycycline if it's in the early stage. Later stages, when things really get bad, like if you have a third degree AV block or you have a bilater bilateral facial nerve palsy, um, encephalomyelitis, anything like that, when things really get bad, people someone's had Lyme disease that went untreated, then you're going to use IV ceftriaxone. That might be a little bit beyond the scope of step one, but there you have it. Um, also, avoid doxy in pregnant patients and children, particularly less than eight years old, um, as you know it can cause teeth color changes and and other um, side effects. So, Babesia is basically your North American malaria. I think that's kind of the way to look at it. So, it causes a severe hemolytic anemia. So, what are you going to have in hemolytic anemia? You're going to have a high LDH. You're going to have a low haptoglobin. You're going to have a increased uh, unconjugated bilirubin. So, these are all things. When you, when you see these things, you know, when you're reading first aid or, or whatever it is, you know, think about what you will actually see in a stem that would lead you down this direction and then make that connection with this, um, this agent. So, Babesia is in northeastern U.S., so you might have these recurring fevers. It might look like malaria, but this, and this person's from, you know, Maine or something, and um, they you know, haven't been out of the country. So it's unlikely that you're going to get malaria. It's probably Babesia. Have they been, is there a tick bite? Is that something that you want to ask and look for? Um, they're going to have these intra-erythrocytic ring forms, which are these Maltese crosses here. That's pretty much pathognomonic. If you see that, um, you know, you have your diagnosis. Um, and you treat with uh, tofaquone and azithromycin, kind of similar to your malaria treatment, um, minus the azithromycin. Okay, anaplasma and Ehrlichia are very similar. First thing to distinguish these two is that um, Ehrlichia infects monocytes. Anaplasma affects granulocytes. Step one loves to ask these very nitty-gritty uh, kind of things, so that's something to note. The second thing is um, anaplasma, again, is transmitted via exoides scapularis. Ehrlichia is transmitted first Amblyopia americana, which is the lone star tick in southeastern U.S. So if they tell you that the patient is from Arkansas, you know, or Oklahoma, they're, you know, they're pushing you in this direction. Um, just to plug this in here, if it was southwestern United States, you might be thinking coccidial mycosis. Um, but, you know, these locations, they're, they're going to usually put in the question for a reason. They have to put you down this road somehow because there's a lot of diseases that cause leukopenia. You know, anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis are two of them, but there's many others. So they're going to have to give you some more. I also put on here that ehrlichiosis is also known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever without the rash because um, of the, you know, flu-like prodrome and that kind of thing. Um, and you also treat anaplasma with doxycycline. You can also use it for ehrlichia because, when in doubt, you treat with doxy. 23. Widened mediastinum is associated with anthrax. Now, in the real world, if you see a widened mediastinum, you're probably not going to jump to anthrax. But on your assembly step one, there are a lot of zebras, and especially in the right um, context, in the right you know question stem, you might be going down this road. Um, your differential diagnosis here would be like uh, aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection, which would both be much more likely than 
an anthrax. Um, it could be a mass, something like that. The bug is Bacillus anthracis. It's a spore-forming bug. It also forms exotoxins, which we'll talk about in a second here. It's gram positive. It's a rod, um, sometimes seen in IV drug users, although that doesn't necessarily have to be in the question stem. I would actually argue more so a lot of their questions are going to have something about like chemical warfare agent or, or something like that. So the toxins. You have a protective antigen, which essentially binds the cell surface, and that allows entry of the edema and the lethal factor. The edema factor... Um, binds calmodulin and basically acts like an adenylate cyclase. So what does that do? That causes these black eschars and all these edematous borders. So that's something to look for. You see a necrotic black eschar surrounded by edema. That's because of the edema factor. And that's something that's seen prevalently with anthrax. The lethal factor destroys cells. It results in macrophage apoptosis. Um, it cleaves, being really specific here, it cleaves the amino terminus of your mitogen activated protein kinase kinases your map kks um, inhibits their signaling pathway so there's no signaling pathway so the cells can't um, survive and so they undergo apoptosis so the edema factor causes these lesions the lethal factor causes macrophage apoptosis so the bacteria can proliferate okay cutaneous anthrax is the most common manifestation it is painless and that's part has something to do with these toxins and the inability for the nerves to respond but it's painless it can be itchy you can have a central vesicle or bullet and again keywords here painless necrotic black eschar surrounded by edema those are all important um you treat with ciprofloxacin or when in doubt doxy right pulmonary anthrax um is a less common form of the disease known as wolf sorter's disease uh, it can cause systemic manifestations shock hypoxia dyspnea and um you need to use a more aggressive antibiotic regimen along with antitoxins when treating it. 22. Chlamydia trachomatis can cause trachoma, cervicitis, conjunctivitis, and lymphogranulum, granuloma venerum. Excuse me. So chlamydia is an obligate intracellular organism. So um, you're not really going to see it on Gramstein, right? But um, things you might see are these reticulate bodies. So those are the metabolically active and replicating form of chlamydia. It's something that you really want to know. It's, again, these, these details, the devil's in the details when you get a question on this. Um, the elementary body, though, is the inactive extracellular form. So E for elementary, E for extracellular, and um, it's inactive. The cell wall uh, lacks peptidoglycan, so you can't use beta-lactam drugs to treat chlamydia. You know that, right? We usually treat it with macrolides. Um, trachoma is something that is seen in the developing world. It's not um, seen here in the U.S. So, they're, again, they're going to have to give you something something in the stem that pushes you down this direction. You might see conjunctival scarring and um, trachasis, inward-growing of the eyelashes. So this is trachoma here. You can see all these inward-growing eyelashes are on the conjunctival side of the eye here, and these are scratching the conjunctiva, and that's going to cause permanent damage. And um, that's why this is a pretty severe disease that can result in blindness if not treated. Cervicitis, um, we're going to see uh, in females that um, have cervical motion tenderness, painful intercourse, they'll have yellow mucopurulent discharge. Again, this can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, um, which can lead to infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and occasionally you'll see a question where they'll have like right upper quadrant pain. And that might be because they have Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, where these um, that inflammation has reached the liver capsule, and so it's it's going to increase the AST ALT and um, give you a picture where you also have liver pathology. Conjunctivitis, so chlamydial conjunctivitis. You're thinking the newborn. Remember day one, if baby comes out and they have conjunctivitis, you're thinking were they exposed to silver nitrate? Is this a chemical conjunctivitis? Day two through five ish, you're thinking gonorrhea, very mucopurulent discharge. Um, typically, the prophylactic topical erythromycin that babies get will prevent uh, gonorrhea, conjunctivitis, but um, doesn't always do that. And then the chlamydial conjunctivitis will come more around week one, maybe week two, not quite as mucopurulent, but you really want to decide what it is based on the days. You don't want to judge it by how purulent the discharge is per se. That's kind of like an added factor that can, that can help sway your decision, but you want to do this all based off the timeline. Um, lymphogranuloma venerum. Um, this is a uh, painless genital ulceration. Okay, there's only two really painful genital ulcerations. That's HSV and um, Haemophilus ducri. Um, so this is painless. And the, the actual lymph adenopathy, though, the buboes, that's painful. So you'll see them along like the inguinal creases and that, and that kind of thing. Though that's what's painful. But the actual lesion itself is not painful. Um, you diagnose this with uh, nucleic acid amplification testing in most cases here. And um, if you have chlamydia on histology, you might see cytoplasmic inclusions. Um, 
different from some of your viral, like HSV, where you'll see intranuclear inclusions. Um, treatment is azithromycin, and um, this is not for all of these, but in general, you would treat chlamydia with azithromycin, but I, here I put it down here. If you're suspecting um, possible malaria for like uh, cervicitis, you would give ceftriaxone along with azithromycin, and then if it's a neonate, um, you can give topical and oral erythromycin. You gotta be careful with the oral erythromycin though, um, and, you know, because they could even throw in a question like, what's the biggest side effect of oral erythromycin in neonates? And the answer would be pyloric stenosis. 21. Strep bovis slash gallolyticus has a strong association with colonic neoplasms. Um, something you should you should definitely know. Um, you'll usually see this bug in infective endocarditis. It could be a bacteremia. It's known as group D strep. It's not hemolytic at all, and it grows in the presence of uh, bile. Can't grow in your sodium chloride broth, and that's how you differentiate it from your enterococci. Um, also, it's a perilidin. Definitely can't pronounce that. P amidase negative. So. Um, Another distinguishing factor from your enterococci. So these are just two ways you can kind of distinguish them. Um, also, no, um, Clostridium septicum is is kind of similar to strep bovis, where it's associated with these colonic neoplasms. So like, let's just say that you have a patient that um, you know you you do a, they have a heart murmur, they have a fever, they have splinter hemorrhages, and you uh, do a culture and you get strep bovis, and it might say, what's the next step? The next step would be colonoscopy because you want to just look and see if there's any of these colonic neoplasms or any pathology in the colon. Twenty. Staph aureus and bacillus cereus cause rapid onset of symptoms of diarrheal illness. So that's because these two release a toxin. Staph aureus is found in custards, mayonnaise, and potato salad, among some other things. Those are the big ones. Bacillus cereus is classically associated with reheated rice. Probably have heard that a few times. Um, and both cause a watery, non-invasive diarrhea. So I just put something here for your viewing pleasure, where um, blue is watery, dark red here is bloody, just to distinguish some of these causes. If they're black, it could be either one. Um, so I'm just going to run through this really quick. Clostridium perfringes, you're thinking reheated meat. And this is going to be not quite as quick of an onset as the staph aureus and bacillus cereus. It might be like six, post six hours after eating it, as opposed to these other two, which are like one to six hours after you eat. Uh, C. diff is associated with antibiotics. Um, major complication is toxic megacolon, which can also be seen in ulcerative colitis. Um, e. hack is associated with undercooked meat. You're thinking classically um, for HUS E. coli 0157H7. There's also two other major forms of E. coli. That's your um, toxigenic form, which is watery diarrhea, and your invasive form, which is bloody because it's invasive. Legionella is associated with contaminated water classically look for that hyponatremia, very severe hyponatremia, and you might, and they're probably also going to have um, a pneumonia. Salmonella associated with raw chicken, sh and Shigella, fecal oral transmission, Campylobacter, classic complication is Guillain-Barre, which is an ascending flaccid paralysis. Um, these three are all um, invasive, so you can have bloody diarrhea. Vibrio cholera, rice water stools, um, uh, parahemolyticus and vulnificus. This thing can be really nasty if you have liver disease. If you have someone with like uh, hemochromatosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, hep B, hep C, etc. This can be a very deadly disease. So know, know that it's particularly bad in liver disease. Uh, Yersinia can cause um, an invasive bloody diarrhea. I kind of Usually in my head, I actually group it in with Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, but the the one thing that to really know here is the pseudoappendicitis. Um, so if you have someone that's got like this right little quadrant pain rebound tenderness, and uh, you know appendix looks fine, but then they have bloody diarrhea, you might start to go down this road. Brucella is associated with unpasteurized dairy. Norwalk, very common in children, adenovirus. Adenovirus, you have your uh, pharyngeal conjunctival fever if they have that and they have diarrhea. Um, you might be going down this road. Rotavirus, very uh, classic in, in infants, very high mortality rate in infants too. You don't want to give the vaccine if they have intussusception um, or if they've had intussusception um, or if they've had henoxal and purpura because of the risk of um, lymphoid hyperplasia acting as the lead point for intussusception. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. I'm just, I'm giving you like everything that comes in my brain as soon as I see these things. So, um, and I might not be covering everything, but I'm just trying to give you a rundown. So, all right. Giardia, classically associated with campers, hikers, um, greasy, foul smelling, stool. Um, this can go on for some time. It can last a couple weeks. And to me, uh, you'll see a, usually a liver cyst. Usually this is invasive, but I, I was reading that actually it can, be, it can be watery. In my brain, it was always invasive, um, but um, apparently that wasn't correct. So it can be a watery diarrhea as well. You might not have any diarrhea at all. A lot of people are actually asymptomatic with this. Um, you treat it with metronidazole. Um, okay, so cryptosporidium. It's got to be an AIDS patient usually. Um, and you know what else I did put in here? Actually, I just noticed is CMV, CMV colitis. If you have a patient that has, is a transplant patient, transplant patient, they're really immunosuppressed, or they have a CD4 count like less than 50, and it's bloody diarrhea, you might want to be thinking of CMV colitis. I don't know if I have that in here or not, but that's something uh, high yield to know. Tinea solium associated with pork. You can also have a neurocystic sarcosis where you have like the lesions in the brain. Tinea saginata is associated with beef. Um, 
and then uh, your Delatum Classic tapeworm. Um, and that's associated with fish. Sushi, in particular. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, 19. Um, most common cause of meningitis in neonates is Group B strep, E. coli, and Listeria, particularly Group B strep, E. coli. Those are the two big ones. Um, bimodal distribution here. So young, old patients with meningitis, you've got to cover Listeria. What do you cover it with? Ampicillin. Um, between three months old and 34 years, your two most common bacteria are Strep pneumo and Neisseria. Over 35 years old, Strep pneumo is the most common. Um, Neisseria kind of drops off. Treatment. Empirically, you're going to treat with vanca and cefotaxime or ceftriaxone. Now, if you have an infant, since we're talking about infants and neonates, you don't want to use ceftriaxone because um, theoretically it can displace some bilirubin and um, cause crinicterus. And crinicterus is usually caused by unconjugated bilirubin. Um, the other thing is you always want to treat meningitis empirically with steroids, regardless of the age. And, and let me tell you why. So in kids, you're going to do it because if they have hemophilus, uh, influence influence of meningitis um, that can cause hearing loss so you give steroids to prevent the hearing loss once you find out you do cultures and you're like oh it's not h flu it's e coli well now you can stop the steroids in adults you do it because you have um strip pneumo actually can cause complications that the steroids can can um, help prevent once you find out that it's not strip pneumo in adults you can discontinue the steroids but in both cases you it, it's it's uh, if it's part of the question somehow that you know what's the other thing that you have to add to your vank and your, you know, cefotaxime or whatever, um, the answer might be steroids, like dexamethasone. 18. Silver stain is used for pneumocystis and legionella. Um, some other stains I put on here, um, heme sustain. Um, we have the periodic acid shift stain. You want to think Whipple's disease. I've seen that come up so many times. Uh, zeal, zeal Nielsen for acid fast organisms. I've listed them here. India Inc. for cryptococcus deformance. Um, Musa Carmine is another stain you can use for cryptococcus for um, making the capsule red. And then I've also found that mycoplasma and ureoplasma have no cell wall. 17. Um, bendazoles work by inhibiting tubulin polymerization. Um, just in general, it's good to know the mechanism of action and side effects of all these drugs. And because, you know, just by just because you know the drug that's used to treat the disease, um, it's usually not enough. Usually you have to know a little bit more to get most of these questions right. Um, I also included, because these always used to confuse me, which drug um, goes with which bug. And um, the way that I remember is just kind of remembering the ones that, you know, like ivermectin is only used really for river blindness, this oncocercasis. Um, and then I probably didn't pronounce that right. And then strongloides. Um, and then the diethyl carbamazine is used for loa loa. And um, this is the bank, Borcheria bancrofti, I believe. And, um, you know, then the prezequantil and the albendazole, mebendazole are used for some of the same organisms. Um, I listed a lot of them here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but I would just, you know, if you can remember these two, the ivermectin and the diethyl carbamazine, um, you know, a lot of your other stuff is just going to fall into one of these two buckets. And if you can remember these two, that's great. Um, the ivermectin works by binding to glutamate-gated chloride channels, causes uh, hyperpolarization, because that's what chloride does, right? <clears throat> and then chloride and potassium both would cause hyperpolarization. And then the um, diethyl carbamazine is going to inhibit arachidonic acid metabolism, and that makes the helminth more susceptible to the host immune system. Um, and then remember that bendazole is worked by tubule. Uh, tubulin polymerization inhibition and uh, presquantil doesn't really have a mechanism of action so that saves you one less thing to remember um, i also put watch out for sjs with albendazoles and mabend or with albendazole and mabendazole uh, remember that stephen johnson syndrome that's where you have your um, you start off with like a really strong flu-like prodrome and then you have like skin peeling and it's um uh, i believe it's less than 10 percent of your mucosal surfaces i think ten is greater than 30 but in any case um, you can have a very severe reaction with some of these drugs so keep that in mind 16. Um, transplant recipients, oh, here it is. Transplant recipients can uh, get CMV pneumonia and colitis. So, um, again, really immunosuppressed patients, really low CD4 count. Um, they can get a, a lymphocytosis with atypical lymphocytes with this disease. Um, this is also seen with Epstein Barr virus. There's a lot of overlap with Epstein Barr. Uh, Epstein Barr virus and CMV. The differentiating factor here is the negative heterophile antibody test, which is positive with EBV. Um, the other thing you might see if they show you um, any histo um, is this owl eye you see here on the left. It looks like a single eye. Whereas if you have two eyes, now you're thinking more Reed Sternberg cells, you're thinking more Hodgkin lymphoma kind of thing. Um, and then treatment against Ciclovir, available against Ciclovir. 15. Lehman Sachs endocarditis is culture negative and associated with lupus. Um, and the reason I put this on here is because I wanted to go through, there's a lot of culture negative things um, that can give you vegetations on valves. So Lehman Sachs is one. So if you have someone that has lupus, right, malar rash, uh, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, 
um, you know, anti double strands of DNA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they have vegetation in a valve. You might be thinking leaf insects, especially if it's culture negative. Um, Hasic organisms are classically also culture negative. Um, the one that I want to call to your attention here is Iconelic rodents, classically associated with poor dentition. Um, Coxiella, also culture negative. Bartonella, remember that's cat scratch disease, also culture negative. And then you have your metastatic endocarditis here. So if someone has cancer, you can also get vegetation and valves. Um, pathology, uh, pathogenesis. Um, so endothelial damage on the surface of a cardiac valve causes a thrombus to form. Bacteria typically adhere to that, and that's how you, um, it gives them almost like a nidus for causing infection. Um, what are you going to see on exam? Uh, new heart murmur fever. These are obviously very common. As we go down the list, things are less common. Roth spots, I think, are always seen in like 5% of patients. Um, and that's where you have those retinal hemorrhages. And this is all, all of this stuff is really, emb it's embolic phenomena, right? Splinter hemorrhages in the fingers, all that stuff. Those are all little um, embolus that are just traveling and clogging up small vessels. Um, you can also have a big embolus, right? You can get a stroke from this. You can get a splenic abscess. You can get a lot of things. So a lot of things can, can be a result of infective endocarditis. If it's left-sided, you got to think stroke. Like I said, splenic abscess, renal infarction, all that stuff. If it's right-sided, you're going to be thinking more of like pulmonary embolus, that kind of thing, just from just anatomically. The most common cause overall of infective endocarditis is staph aureus. That's why you, you empirically treat with vancomycin, um, and you're also going to tack ceftriaxone on there for other organisms. Um, viridins is classically associated with dental procedures. It's subacute kind of forms over a long period of time. We already said strep bovis is associated with colon cancer, so you do a colonoscopy. Um, enterococcus is associated with uh, UTI and GU procedures. So someone that just had a UTI, and now they have a heart murmur. Maybe you're thinking enterococ enterococcus. Um, prosthetic valves, you're thinking staph epidermitis. Remember, that's coagulase negative. Um, prosthetic valves, though, you can also have... Um, Staph aureus growing on those as well. So they're going to have to kind of give you something. But um, okay, 14. Clostridium tetani produces tetanospasm, which cleaves synaptic brevin, which uh, essentially blocks the release of glycine and GABA. Remember, glycine and GABA are inhibitory neurotransmitters, so you're blocking the release, so you're inhibiting the inhibitor, and that's going to cause a lot of stimulation. Um, and so this is sometimes seen uh, neonatal if you have if they have like a midwife or something that's helping with the delivery, the, and the, you know they have a dirty umbilical stump, it's not sterilized. Um, Tetanus can, uh, can colonize there. Classically, we vaccine for this with two, four, and six month DTAP, and then at 15 and 18 months, they get their fourth dose, and then around four to six years, they'll get their fifth dose. Then you give them Tdap in adolescence, and then you get TD in 10 year intervals. Um, what does it uh, look like in terms of clinical picture? Spastic paralysis, right? The muscles are um, really tightening up, trismus, you have like the lock jaw, you have the um, rhesus sardonicus, where their you know, eyebrows are up, and they're, you know their whole face is almost spasmed, and then you have the spinal muscle spasms, and you can Google some of these um, terms, and you can look up the pictures to kind of get an idea of what you're looking at. You probably have seen them before. Um, now, if, if there's, there's two major types of wounds that you can get if, you know, if you're, if, you know, for example, like if, if there's a nail on the floor we can, and you step in it, and we consider that usually a dirty wound. Um, you know, clean wounds are, are just minor injuries. So the thing you want to, I want to call your attention to here is the dirty wounds. So if you have a dirty wound, so it's like, again, let's say you step on a nail, the first question is, are you vaccinated? So let's just say you, you're not vaccinated. You've never been vaccinated or you don't remember ever being vaccinated. In that case, you're going to get the tetanus immune globulins, which is the passive immunity, as well as vaccination, which is the active immunity. If you do have vaccination and, and you know you stepped on the nail, you have vaccinations, they're all up to date. The question is, when did you get that last booster? Was it more than five years ago? Because if it was, let's boost you again with another tetanus booster. You don't need the the immune globulins because you already have some immunity to this. So we're just giving you a booster just to kind of make sure, keep the um, kick up the response a little bit higher than it already is, right? If you've got a booster, you know, a year ago and you stepped on this nail, uh, you're good. You know, that's it. You don't have to do anything, okay? And then I just put the clean wound um, synopsis on here for completeness. 13. HIV virus GP120 attaches to CD4 positive T cells. So um, I'm going to walk you through this process. So HIV uh, the virus is uh, going to attach to CD4 T cells, specifically ones with CXCR4 or CCR5 binding sites. And it's going to do this through this GP120. Now, when it does that, it's going to uncoat, enter the cell. The RNA genome of the HIV is going to be reverse transcribed into DNA. Okay? So the RNA is going to get turned into DNA once it gets in the cell. The DNA from the HIV is then going to get put into the host genome. Once it does that, it's going to be read by the host machinery, right? DNA polymerase and all that stuff. And it's going to 
code for more viral particles. Those viral particles will build up, build up, build up, build up inside the host cell, and eventually it'll lyse the host cell. And it will release all these viral particles into the bloodstream, and the cycle will repeat. So then, you know, a new HIV virus with all this machinery is going to bind to a new cell with GP120 and CXCR4, CCR5, uncoat, you know, reverse transcribe its RNA to DNA, integrate, and build more, and then burst that cell. And it's going to happen over and over again on these CD4 cells. If a person doesn't have CXCR4 or CCR5 in their cells, let's say they have a mutation, it's going to be very difficult for HIV to attach. And so those people will be more immune to the HIV virus, right? Okay. Um, the env gene codes for GP160. GP160, right, 160 is equivalent to 120 plus 40, and then you just got to add one here. So 160 from the env gene, I think envelope, makes the env gene makes GP160, and GP160 makes GP120, and GP41. So if you add these two together again, they get pretty close to 160. So GP120, we just said, is used for attachment. GP41, for D14 for, for fusion and entry right so um, this would be the second step so we attach first then we fuse and enter the cell now our gag gene is going to be responsible for p24 and p17 the clinical significance here is that p24 is associated with the viral capsule which is something that we are detecting when we do hiv serology so when, so when we think so when we're doing a screening for example and we do you know hiv 1 2 antibodies we might also do the hiv p24 and so we're trying to detect this viral capsid from the gag gene P17 is the matrix proteins, also coming from the gag gene. The pol gene um, codes for your reverse transcriptase, right? Once we get in the cell, we have to use that to convert the RNA to DNA. It also codes for an aspartate protease, and it integrates, right? Integrase is used for getting into the cell. Protease is used for cleaving some of these other proteins, like the, um, I believe, the GP160 to the GP120 and 41, but don't quote me on that. Okay. 12. Pneumocystis gyrovici is an opportunistic infection occurring at less than 200 CD4 count. So um, I put some of the big ones on it. There's, there's a lot of different things that can happen when this CD4 count is low. Um, you know, you can get candidal plaques on the tongue, thrush, right? You can get that with a CD4 count less than 500, technically. Um, for it to be like a candidal esophagitis, though, where it invades the esophagus, then it has to be less than 200. Um, CMV and esophagitis is um, classically associated with these linear um, lesions on the esophagus, and HSV esophagitis are associated with these very painful circular uh, lesions in the esophagus, like ulcers. Um, PCP, we just said less than 200, and um, cryptosporidium parvum, we said diarrhea, again, less than 200. Um, histoplasma, less than 150, particularly if you're in uh, Mississippi River Valley. Toxoplasma, less than 100, you're looking for ring enhancing. Um, brain lesions, um, MAC less than 50, and then um, we, I put on here Kaposi sarcoma, uh, cat scratch, and PML from JC virus reactivation. So I'll talk about all of these probably in another video. I don't think I hit on much of these here just because there's so much material, but um, these are all diseases you want to be familiar with because you'll probably get a couple questions about immunocompromised HIV patients. Um, the last thing I put in here, this sometimes throws people off. So someone that has a CD4 count over 200 and they ask you, you know, what's the most likely cause of a pneumonia that they have? It's strep pneumo, right? I mean, unless they give you some other information, you know, like a subacute presentation and bilateral interstitial infiltrates, in which case you might be thinking, oh, I don't know, it sounds more like mycoplasma, maybe a TB picture. But if they're just a classic case of pneumonia, someone who has, you know, a relatively normal CD4 count greater than 200, it's strep pneumo, right? Because they're not immunocompromised. If they're immunocompromised, yeah, okay, it's a different story. But just because they have HIV, if their CD4 count is near normal, then they're going to get the same infections that everybody else gets. Okay. All right. 11. Afirinez is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that can cause strange dreams and neuropsychiatric effects. This is particularly a side effect that you want to know because I've seen this come up. Um, the other non-nucleoside uh, transcriptase, reverse transcriptase inhibitor is nevirapine. That one classically causes hepatotoxicity. Um, the um, NRTIs all cause lactic acidosis. Didanazine, very high yield one to know, causes uh, pancreatitis. So you have someone that has an amylase lipase elevation um, out of the blue when put on this drug. Zidovidine, used in pregnancy. That's the one that you can use in pregnancy, right? Causes bone marrow suppression. Uh, so you can get an aplastic anemia-like picture. Or you might even have just like a leukopenia or something like that. That can be because of the zidovidine. A back of ear can cause a hypersensitivity reaction. And then you have your, I put some of the other NRTIs below. Protease inhibitors, which all end in navir, 
uh, all cause lipodystrophy and insulin resistance. So these are drugs that you got to kind of be careful using in people that have diseases like diabetes. Um, and denivir causes kidney stones. Um, and then I put some of the other ones on the bottom here. Integrase inhibitors all cause myopathy. They all end in gravir. 10. Most genital lesions are painless, except for HSV and Haemophilus ducreyi, which we just uh, talked about. I think we talked about that earlier in the video. So um, HSV is far more common in developed countries than um, Haemophilus ducreyi. So if they give you a patient that comes in and they got, uh, and they just describe, you know, painful ulcer uh, lesions, and that they don't really give you a lot to go on, you might want to go towards HSV unless this person's an immigrant or something like that, because I think there's only like 30 or 50 cases of ducreyi in the whole U.S. every year, if that, and, and again, don't quote me on that, but it's a very, very small number. Um, <clears throat> trepanema, right, syphilis, primary syphilis, painless, um, and you will have lymphadenopathy. Now, lymphadenopathy can be painful, but the actual lesion itself will be painless. Uh, condyloma acuminata, right, this is your uh, HPV, classically 6 and 11. Remember, 16 and 18 are, are more associated with cervical cancer, and these are going to be the chelocytes. Lymphogranuloma venerum, um, again, we're going back to chlamydia. You'll see the reticulate bodies, the elementary bodies. Um, Remember, elementary bodies, extracellular and not active. Particularly bodies are uh, metabolically active. This is serotypes L1 through L3. Granuloma inguinale um, is going to cause um, a lot of extensive lesions that are typically painless, but the thing that differentiates it from lymphogranuloma venerum is there's no lymphadenopathy. Okay, so I've always got those two confused, um, but that's how you distinguish them. Lymphogranuloma venerum has her lymph in there, so it's going to have lymphadenopathy. Granuloma inguinale doesn't have that word in there, so it's not going to have uh, and, um, lymphadenopathy. And you'll classically see these diamond bodies, these gram-negative rods. And here's a picture of some chelocytes. Nine. Canada vaginitis occurs with a normal vaginal pH. So Canada um, will have a said normal vaginal pH, and that is between 3.8 and about 4.5, depending on the source you look at. Um, so you'll have thick cottage cheese discharge, vaginal inflammation. Um, when you do a KOH prep, you'll see pseudohyphate, and you treat that with fluconazole. And here's a picture of some of the pseudohyphate. Trichomonas, let me move this back. Trichomonas um, and Gar uh, Garnella vaginalis, both are going to have a higher pH. Trichomonas, though, is going to give you these protozoa with this corkscrew motility. Um, and Trichomonas and Canada both have vaginal inflammation, whereas Garnella vaginalis does not. No inflammation there. Um, Trichomonas is going to cause a thin yellow green melodorous keyword here, frothy discharge. Whenever you see frothy discharge here, and it's, this is not in a book anywhere, this is just in my brain for some reason, this is pathognomonic. When you see frothy, you think trichomonas. Um, wet mount microscopy is what's used to diagnose it. You treat it with metronidazole. You also want to treat the sexual partner because it can be sexually transmitted. Unlike Garnella vaginalis, which is not sexually transmitted, also treated with metronidazole. The big test here is the positive whiff test. You get an amine odor when you add KOH. And again, no inflammation. With Gardenella, all the other ones there, there is um, uh, inflammation. And uh, this one, you have your clue cells, which is, you know, you have your um, bacteria that are all over the place here on the cell. And that's a classic depiction of bacterial vaginosis or Gardenella vaginalis, right? And then here's trichomonas, and then here's your candida. Eight. post lymphadenopathy is highly associated with rubella. Okay, so here I'm comparing a lot of rubella and measles. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I just want to say, it's just came in my head. Um, Epitrochlear lymphadenopathy is classically associated with syphilis as well. So those are kind of two that you just remember where the lymphonodes are, and you can pretty much figure out the answer. So if they tell you post lymphadenopathy, you should be like 95% chance they're talking about rubella. Epitrochlear lymphadenopathy, 95% chance they're talking about syphilis, right? Okay, so rubella is a tocovirus, positive RNA virus, as opposed to measles, who's negative RNA. I just remember measles, man. Measles is mean, and it is uh, a lot worse to have measles than rubella, so this one's negative. Now that stands true unless you are a fetus, in which case you have a congenital infection from rubella. Um, in that case, you're thinking blueberry muffin rash, cataracts, uh, sensory neural hearing loss, PDA, right? Patent duct cirrhosis. Um, both of these are ceph cephalocaudal spreads. They start in the face, head, and they kind of move down. They both have these unique spots. The Forschenheimer spots are seen in rubella. So just because they show you a picture of a mouth doesn't mean that it's measles, right? Because these, these petechial hemorrhages are um, on the um, soft palate. And these are a sign of rubella. If they're on the buccal mucosa and they're these like white blue macular lesions, then you're thinking more of the complex spots. Again, measles, paramix of virus, negative RNA virus. They're both enveloped. Um, hem uh, measles uses this hemagglutinin protein to get into host cells. It causes a confluent maculopapular rash, whereas rubella is non-confluent. Uh, non and then measles causes conjunctivitis, carries a cough. And um, I have seen this in a question somewhere. If you biopsy the lymph nodes of someone with measles, they have giant cells, particularly called this Warthin um, Finkelday giant cells. Hopefully I pronounced that right. And these are um, just fused lymphocytes, and that is a sign of measles as well.
7. Vitamin A reduces morbidity and mortality in patients with measles. Um, I took this opportunity to talk a little bit about other um, places you might uniquely see vitamin A. So all trans retinoic acid, vitamin A, is used for acute promyelocytic leukemia. So keep that in mind. Isotrentinoin is used for severe cystic acne when you've exhausted all of your resources at acne or it's really, really bad. This is your go-to option. If you put somebody on this, remember, you have to do a pregnancy test and you have to have them um, on a, uh, a very regimented um, birth control um, pro um, medication. So, and, it's also, and that's because it's a severe teratogen. Okay. High levels of vitamin A are also associated with pseudotumor cerebri. So there's a lot of things that can cause pseudotumor cerebri theoretically, like growth hormone tetracyclines. This is just another one of those things. I mean, if you're if you're trying to be like in your two, in the 270 club or whatever you want to call it, and you want to know everything, this is this is something that potentially I think could show up. But um, you know, or if you see a patient that's overweight and they're you know having a diplopia and they're taking vitamin A, you know, or they're taking isotretin known for acne or something like that, you can start to build a picture for pseudotumor cerebri. So just thought I'd put that in there for you. Six. Hep B is the only DNA virus of the hepatitis virus family. All the rest are RNA. Um, so uh, it's partially double-stranded. I'm just going to go through the mechanism of action here briefly. Um, and before I do that, it's transmitted via blood exposure, sexual contact, perinatally. So there's a lot of different ways you can get Hep B. Um, it deals all of its damage in the liver. Surprise, surprise. So the positive strand of the Hep B DNA is synthesized and then converted to closed circular DNA in the liver the hepatocytes. So that's a CCC DNA. So here's your virus. It enters, it goes into the cell via endocytosis, and it gets the nuclear material imported um, and closed to form this CCC DNA. Then through reverse transcription of the genome, it um, creates RNA, which then becomes encapsulated. So here, I believe this is the side here. And then the new negative and positive strand is eventually synthesized, and the partially double-stranded HBV DNA nucleocapsid can now go on to produce and enter more um, hepatocytes and eventually produce more of the CCC DNA. Now, the other thing about the CCC DNA, you see this is one route where you're making more negative positive strands, but it's also transcribing the Hep B surface antigen, which leads to glycosylation of the virus here. So it's kind of doing multiple things, multiple forms of transcription, and it's really a complex cycle, but this is the gist of what you should know um, in terms of its mechanism of action. Five. The window phase of a uh, hep B virus infection has an elevated IgM anti-core, and it can also have elevated hep B DNA. So let's just go through these all really quickly. Um, so early phase, right, early phase of infection, the antigen is going to be elevated. Why is the antigen elevated? Well, remember that CCC DNA is going to be producing it, right? And so when you're infected initially, you're going to have the antigen. Now, you could also have a hep, um, hepatitis B E antigen, and this is just basically... Um, telling you how uh, the level of infectivity of the virus. So if they ever ask you what's the E antigen telling you, it's the level of infectivity of the virus. The core is going to come on pretty early after you're infected, so that might be elevated as well, and you might have a high level, you should have a very high level of this HBV DNA. Okay, so that's the early phase. In the window phase, it's like, okay, now you're starting to kind of get over things. You're still going to have your core around, but that surface antigen is going to be pretty much completely gone at this point. So, but just because you don't have a surface antigen, it doesn't mean that you've recovered yet. Okay, so in the window phase, the only thing that might be elevated is the core. You might not even have any more HBV DNA, depending on how much you're clearing this thing. So the thing to remember about the window phase is you might just have IgM against the core during this period. In the recovery phase... Now you have IgG against the core because enough time has gone by for you to make your IgG. The anti-HEP B surface antigen will also be elevated, showing that you've recovered or are in the process of recovering from this infection. And you also have your anti-HBE, uh, and you can still have the HBV DNA in a recovery phase. Now in the immune phase, once you, once you have completely cleared this thing, now the HBV DNA is going to go away. So that's the big difference um, when you get to that stage. Okay. Chronic carriers will have the surface antigen elevated because they've never cleared it. And they'll have IgG against the core because enough time has gone by to make IgG. But again, they don't have the antibody. They don't have the anti hep B surface antigen. They just have the surface antigen. So that shows they're still infected and they have not cleared the disease. If you're vaccinated, you have the anti hep B surface antigen, but you don't have a core, right? You don't have an IgM. You don't have an IgG against the core. And the reason for that is because you were never infected. You literally just got enough to form this surface anti-surface antigen. You don't have a core. So that's a big thing to know. It's particularly high yield to know that. Um, 
And if you were immune because you had the infection in the past, that was basically you going down this whole path, early phase, window phase, recovery phase, and now you're here. So you end up with the core, the IgG against the core, and you have the surface, the anti-HEP B surface antigen. Okay, so know this. Four, reassurance if patient with known immunity exposed to HEP B. Okay, so what I'm trying to say there, that's really not a very good way to say it. So if you have, if you're exposed to HEP B, you have immunity to it, all you gotta do is reassure, reassure the patient, okay? Now, let's talk about cases where people are exposed but don't have known immunity. So let's say that a child's born to a mother with uh, HEP B. She has active infection, right? In that case, you gotta give the child the immune globula, HBIG, but you're also going to vaccinate. Vaccinate within 12 hours of birth anyway, right? You got to give them both because she has an active infection. You got to give some passive immunity. Similarly, someone that's exposed that has unknown immunity or they are not immune, they're going to get the same thing. HBIG, because you got to give them passive immunity. They were just exposed and you want to start creating an immune response. So you give them the uh, Hep B vaccine. Also note, Hep B and C, if it's chronic, increases the risk of cirrhosis, right? All that chronic liver damage, and that can cause hepatocellular carcinoma. Three. Hepatitis C is associated with essential mixed cryoglobulinemia. Hepatitis C is associated with so many things, okay? Um, I'm just going to kind of talk you through the things that I think are particularly high yield to make an association with for Hep C. Before I do that, let's go through what is mixed cryoglobulinemia. That's when you have the cold agglutinins, right, the IgM antibodies. Um, this can also be seen with mycoplasma, by the way. Um, they make these IgM antibodies, and remember those are really big, and so those can kind of get stuck in the distal limbs, um, give you some arthralgias, palpable perp, uh, purpura, hepatosplenomegaly, you have some kidney disease, potentially hematuria, proteinuria, um, in the setting of an underlying hep C infection. Okay, so that should make you kind of suspect this. Very unique skin lesions, right, palpable purpura, you're not going to see very often unless, you know, you have meningitis or a neck fash or something like that, um, and then hepatosplenomegaly, and then kidney problems too, so it's an interesting mixed bag of things here. You diagnose it with serum cryoglobulins. You're also going to have low complement because you're using up some of your complement. And again, you have a paddle so surprise, surprise, the liver enzymes are probably going to be elevated. Uh, treat the underlying hep C, and that usually resolves the, the uh, mixed cryoglobulinemia. You can use plasmapheresis to get out some of these cryoglobulins to relieve some of the symptoms, but that's more of a transient thing. You've got to treat the underlying hep C to really relieve the disease. You can also give them cyclophosphamide or immunosuppressant, something like that, to make things better. By the way, what's the um, major side effect of cyclophosphamide? Hemorrhagic cystitis. Okay, um, let's uh, get back on track here. So, other Hep C associations, membranoproliferative proliferative and membranous nephropathy, are both classically associated with Hep C. Um, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, we just say chronic liver, anything that causes chronic liver damage, whether it's alpha one antitrypsin deficiency or hemochromatosis, those are all putting you at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma, again, um, another key association with Hep C. Uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemias can occur, porphyria, cutanea tarda, you know, and again, when you're seeing these, you know, it's, it's one thing to memorize these, but then it's another thing to know in a question stem, what are they going to say, right? It's going to be someone that's, you know, that's had hep C for years, right? And then now they're having blistering skin lesions, right? Or maybe they're having uh, hematuria all of a sudden, and they're, and they're having swelling, and they're hypercoagulant, maybe they got a PE, right? You know, thinking glomerulonephritis and the blistering skin lesions thinking PCT, right? So that's kind of how you have to think about it. Lichen planus, right? Those are the P's, the polygonal, paritic, papular plaques. Um, and then you have autoimmune hypothyroidism, all associated with hep C. Two, a nice clean slide for two. Perform hep C virus RNA testing after a positive anti-hep uh, C um, antibody screen. So just because someone's po so what I'm trying to say here, just because someone's positive for hep C antibody, it doesn't mean that they're over the disease, right? We just went through all those antibodies for hep B. For hep C, once you see that the antibody screen is positive, you have to see, do they have an active infection? The way I kind of remember this is hep C is a chronic, it's almost always chronic. And so you don't really know if just because they have an antibody, if they've cleared the infection. The antibody is just saying, hey, have you been exposed? It doesn't say um, if they've cleared it. So you still have to get RNA testing. If they have HCV RNA, then they have an active infection. One. Hepatitis E is associated with fulminant hepatic failure in pregnancy. So remember that, that hepatitis E classically is, is going to be somehow in a stem with a pregnant patient. I don't see any other way they can ask you a question about hepatitis E. The highest risk is in the third trimester. It's going to be someone usually that's traveling. It's transmitted via, via fecal oral. The way I kind of remember this part here, the, that fecal oral is associated with hep A and E. So I think oral, so I'm thinking, you know, where the food comes in, fecal, where the food comes out. And then I'm thinking all of the hepatitis viruses, A through E. A is where it comes, you know, you start aka where the food comes in, E is where you end, where the food comes out. And so that, I don't know if that helps you at all, but 
hepatitis A and E are associated with fecal oral. That's how I remember it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Appreciate all the support, guys. Thank you for the, the comments. Um, it definitely gives me motivation to uh, keep trying to give you as good of content as I possibly can, and I hope you enjoyed the video.